This is the Mass of the second Sunday after Pentecost. <clears throat> the epistle is taken from St. John, chapter 3. Beloved, do not be surprised if the world hates you. We know that we have passed from death to life because we love the brethren. He who does not love abides in death. Everyone who hates his brother is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. And we have come to know his love, that he has laid down his life for us. And we likewise ought to lay down our life for the brethren. He who has the goods of this world and sees his brother in need and closes his heart to him, how does the love of God abide in him? My dear children, let us not love in word, neither with the tongue, but in deed and in truth. The Holy Gospel. Taken from St. Luke chapter 14. At that time Jesus spoke to the Pharisees this parable. A certain man gave a great supper, and he invited many, and he sent his servant at, at the supper time to tell those that were invited to come, for everything is now ready. And they all with one accord began to excuse themselves. The first said to him, I have bought a farm, and I must go out and see it. I pray thee, hold me excused. And another said, I have bought five yoke of oxen, and I am on, on my way to try them. I pray thee, hold me excused. And another said, I have married a wife, and therefore I cannot come. And the servant returned and reported these things to his master. Then the father of the house of the, was angry and said to his servant, Go out quickly into the streets, and lanes of the city, and bring in here the poor, and the crippled, and the blind, and the lame. And the servant said, Sir, thy order has been carried out, and still there is room. Then the master said to the servant, Go out into the highways and hedges, and make them come in, so that my house may be filled. For I tell you that none of them that were invited shall taste of my supper. Thus are the words of the sacred scripture. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. So as you see, the, uh, the crisis in the church the crisis in the church is very similar to the time of St. Athanasius. St. Athanasius was the one bishop. Uh, there were several others throughout the world at the time, um, among them St. John Chrysostom and uh, a few other saints, St. Saint Basil. But St. Athanasius stood out the most because he publicly defended and was the most persecuted for defending the Holy Catholic faith. Where were all the other bishops? Where were all the other priests? They had all gone with the new religion called the Arian heresy. The Arian heresy uh, held that Christ was a superman. Christ was very holy. Christ was the greatest example for all to follow. But he was not God. And that's a heresy. That If we say that, we have lost the Catholic faith. And so all the bishops of the time, most of them fell, as St. Jerome himself wrote, the whole world groaned to find itself gripped in heresy, infected with the cancer of heresy. Now, our days are much worse because modernism doesn't just attack Christ as God. Modernism, as St. Pius X 
is a, is a synthesis, it's a septic tank of all heresies that attacks the very roots of the faith. And we might even say this is the last and final heresy against our Lord Jesus Christ because it's, complete, it's a complete heresy, meaning it attacks at the level of catechism, at the level of scripture, at the level of common sense, it attacks at the level of philosophy and theology, and at the level of the divine uh, sacred liturgy, the mass, and at all the sacraments. Modernism is a wholesale attack at every level. And that's why we could say truly, these are the end times, because there cannot be a worse heresy. And it is so infectious, this disease. Uh, just look, since Vatican II, that was 50 years ago. 1965 was the close of the Second Vatican Council. And we're 50 years now after it. And look, the bishops have all lost the faith just about. Very few of them even believe in the Blessed Sacrament. Very few of them really believe in anything of the Catholic faith anymore. And many, many priests have lost the faith. We have a pope who is taking souls to hell. Pope Francis is a bad example. And his words are a scandal to the whole world. And our Lord warned us, Woe to you when the world praises you. Woe to you when the world applauds you. And he told the apostles, You're not going to be loved by the world. In fact, the world is going to hate you because you teach the world, those of good will, the way to heaven and how to escape how to escape the fires of hell. So, uh, Vatican II is, is a wholesale destruction of the whole Catholic faith. And so, we are down to a few, like the times of St. Athanasius. That's why I have Mass in a hotel. And all those traditional groups that stood up since in the last 50 years. And there were many of them, many good priests, and many independent priests who died fighting and there were traditional groups who started maybe well, but they have all fallen to the conciliarism of Vatican II. And last, but not the least, the Society of St. Pius X, the last bastion of Catholic tradition. And the leadership has caved in and now accepts Vatican II in the so-called light of tradition, now accepts the new profession of faith that Archbishop Lefebvre condemned, the new code of canon law, which is loaded with heresies, and among the worst of it all is accepting the heresy of religious liberty. Now, that's a whole sermon in itself, but very simply put, religious liberty attacks our Lord Jesus Christ as king. It says Jesus Christ is just, he's just one option among many. Uh, he's one equal with Buddha, he's equal with Muhammad, with Luther, and he's just one among many, and everyone should have a choice to believe what they want. And this is false teaching. You and I, we do not have the right and the choice to believe what we want. We have to believe what God revealed. And if I choose to believe what I want, other than what God has revealed, our Lord told us already, I stand condemned. I stand condemned. Because he himself said to the apostles, Go preach. All that I taught you, go preach to all nations, baptizing them, not in the name of Muhammad or Allah, not in the name of Luther, or not in the name of Buddha, or not in the name of Krishna, but in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, the true God, who is one in essence, three in persons. And we profess this, and we, we profess it and chant to the glory of God and proclaim this to the world. And then our Lord tells us, who believes and is baptized will be saved. Who does not believe, who refuses the truth from the mouth of Christ, who backed it up with all his miracles, who backed it up with all the prophecies, who backed it up with rising from the dead and ascending into heaven and a virgin birth, who backs it up still with continual miracles that rebuke our modern godless age, with incorrupt saints scattered throughout the earth. St. Catherine Labore, she's been dead uh, since the 1800s. She's never rotted, and no chemicals in her. St. Bernadette, she, she looks like she's sleeping. 
There's no chemicals. There's no mummification. It's just her sleeping in a glass coffin. And people for hundreds of years now have come to ask her prayers and have seen many miracles. And that's just to list two of many, many saints, plus all the miracles that we of Guadalupe's Tuma, of the Virgin Mary, and the Shroud of Turin. So, who refuses the Catholic faith, who refuses this truth, will be condemned. And that's just the way it is. We can all say, oh, that sounds harsh, oh, that sounds mean, or, sorry, that's what, that is the mouth of God. And He has sealed it. And, and the Virgin Mary in Fatima in 1917, she appeared to three shepherd children, just in case, and notice she appears, what is it, three, three years after the death of Saint Pope St. Pius X, who, who smashed the modernist heresy in the Catholic Church, or tried to, but the snakes went underground, and after he died, they came back up and infiltrated the seminaries and got inside the bishops, priests, and at Vatican II, they were ripe for the triumph of modernism in the church, which was the French Revolution in the church, the, oh, the attack against Christ, the king. And now they rule. Now the modernists rule. And here we are having mass <laughs> in a hotel because of it. But blessed be God. And uh, some people, many Catholics, are scandalized by this. Oh, mass in a hotel, mass in a bar, mass in a living room. Well, let's put it... Let's put a very, uh, very straightforward language. If there was a professional football player from the NFL coming and he, he invited anybody come to visit him in town in his room in a hotel, you can bet there'll be a line all the way down the hall, down the hotel the steps. The elevators would be constantly full. There'll be buses lined up. Just to, And if he was a friendly guy and he was giving out signatures and giving out hockey pucks or footballs or signed baseballs, Americans would be lined up. It'd be, it'd be, there would just be no room in the whole hotel. But here, here we have the living God who's soon going to be on this altar, on this altar. And I bless this room before the Mass. And the living God of heaven and earth, given to us in the Most Holy Eucharist, in the, in the sacrifice of the cross, which is the most important action, far more important than the Super Bowl, that the living God died on the cross to save us from hell and to pour out on the, the world the grace and to give to those who thirst and hunger the, his living body, his blood, his soul and divinity. And his whole desire is that we, we be united to him Unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, he said, you will not have life in you. You will not have life in you. And he says, those who eat my flesh and drink my blood will have eternal life. He wants us to come to him in Holy Communion. And so realistic is this truth that it, the bread and the wine are truly changed in the body and blood, soul, and divinity of Christ. That St. Paul confirms it. And he says, if anyone eats and drinks unworthily, that is, in the state of mortal sin, what does he say? Uh, well, they're, they're disrespectful. No, it's worse than that. They, they didn't think much about their soul, and they're just getting themselves in trouble. It's much worse than that. St. Paul says, who eats and drinks unworthily, that is, receives Holy Communion and mortal sin, are guilty of the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, guilty of murder. It's guilty of murder, like, like having re-crucified Christ with their bare hands. So this re-emphasizes that Christ is truly there. And look at all the Eucharistic miracles that are still there for veneration. You can fly today, take a flight to Florence, Italy, go into the Cathedral of Florence, and you will see in, in the church the miracle of the sacred host and the, the precious blood that are still there. 
that were miraculously changed at the mass of a priest in the in the 1300s. <laughs> this priest doubted. It was called the miracle of Lanciano. That's the name of the nearby uh, town where the miracle happened. And the priest doubted. He was praying that God would hear his prayer to strengthen his faith because he was doubting the power of the words of Christ at Mass. And at the Mass, God did hear his prayer. And the host changed, not just substantially, which is what happens in every Mass, but also accidentally. The accidents, the appearance became also the living flesh of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the blood changed into the real blood. And in the 1970s, the, the scientists were given permission by the Pope to, to try to disprove this. Because thousands of people every year come and venerate this miracle. And uh, the scientists just came out with all the evidence that they just can't explain this. And on top of that, they said it was the blood and flesh of a 33-year-old man who died a traumatic death because all the blood cells are in a state of trauma. And the heart is the flesh of the, the sacred host was a cut of a human heart, which, was, which is surgically almost impossible to cut. And it has all the chemicals of a real human body and all the hemoglobins and all the iron and vitamins and minerals that, that are in a normal human heart and human flesh and blood. And, uh, of course, it's the, it's the very heart of our Lord Jesus Christ. And that's just one miracle, let alone, there are over 250 recorded Eucharistic miracles, hosts that bled, hosts that have holes punctured by people who made sacrileges against the host. One Quaker stole a host, took it home in Spain, and started crushing on it, calling it Catholic idolatry. And one of the nails in his uh, wooden shoes punctured the host. And he was in his frenzy stomping on the host and found himself splashing in blood. And he couldn't believe it. And when he stepped back, he saw the host was bleeding. And that host is still venerated in Spain. It's exposed every year, once a year, one day a year, in uh, the Escorial in Spain. And it's a beautiful monstrance of gold. So, our Lord uh, invites, He invites us, He wants us to keep the faith in this age when most are losing the faith. And it shouldn't be so surprising to us. It's not a big deal, really. It's happened before many times in church history and many persecutions when we're not living physical persecution yet, yet. That will come, but we're certainly living through the moral persecution. When those Catholics throughout the world who just want to stay Catholic, who want to hold on to the faith of all time, and believe all that Christ has taught, and all that the Catholic Church has taught, are morally being persecuted, and being kicked out of the churches, being driven out. And this is now happening in our dear Society of St. Pius X. The, the conciliar SSPX now uh, will not tolerate those who take the position of the resistance. And the resistance is what? It's simply those Catholics who just want to keep the Catholic faith. That's all. Which means we don't want to accept Vatican II and, and attack the kingship of Christ, attack his divinity, attack the Holy Mass. Because Vatican II attacks Christ as God, as king, as priest. And we, as children of our Heavenly Father, as professors those who profess the Catholic faith of the apostles, of all the fathers, of all the church of all time, the Holy Catholic Church, we, we want to proclaim that Christ is God. He is King. He is the eternal High Priest. There is no other name under heaven whereby we can go to heaven and be saved. There's no other way. So it's a crime for Pope Francis and the Vatican II probes to promote a doctrine that's completely new and novel never been heard of in the Catholic Church before, religious liberty, ecumenism, collegiality. These are novelties which have already been condemned by previous popes. And for Bishop Follet, the superior general, to fall into this, and all the priests 
going behind him, cheerleading him, and are silent about it, they also betray our Lord. And it's a serious betrayal. So we don't want to betray our Lord. We want to stay faithful to Christ, to all his popes, who faithfully handed down the Catholic faith. That's called tradition, handing down all that Christ taught. That's the duty of the Pope is to hand down all that Christ taught and not to change it and not to novelize it and compromise it. And if the world comes to the point, as it has many times in history, where the world doesn't like Christ's teaching and tries to slam it down and tries to extinguish it, tries to get rid of it, <laughs> well, they can try all they want. They can try all they want. They will never succeed because we have the great promise from the mouth of Christ the King, that the gates of hell shall never prevail. And St. Athanasius, who lived five times, he had to flee for his life. He was excommunicated by a weak pope, Pope Liberius. In this pope, you can find it in the annals of the history of the church and in the writings of the documents, this pope Liberius signed a her heretical document. Did he stop being pope? No, he was still pope. He was still Pope. You have had bad Popes in history. They were still Popes. And if you look in the Old Testament, you find tons of priests, tons of high priests, tons of prophets who went bad. And they still were prophets and kings. They didn't lose their office. So that's a, it's an error to say the Pope is not Pope because he's a bad Pope. That's not the case. That's like saying your dad is not your dad because he's a bad father or mother. They're getting drunk and, and spending the money or abusing their children. They're still dad and they're still mom and nothing will take that away. So the, the Pope is still Pope. And we pray for Pope Francis for his conversion every Mass. But we must publicly, openly resist his destruction of the Catholic faith. We have to as Catholics. Because we're not professors of Pope Francis. We're professors of our Lord Jesus Christ and Pope Francis is, is not the successor of Jesus Christ. He's his vicar. He's his vicar, which means he doesn't have the right to change the Catholic faith, nor Pope John Paul II, nor Pope Paul VI. So we are now 50 years since this revolution within the Catholic Church, and it's being shaken down to the few who are going to stay faithful. And let us pray and be watchful, because any of us can lose the faith and go with the easy route. It's so easy to go with the world. And it's so easy to go with the flow. It really is. It's, you know, less headaches, less stress, <laughs> less trouble. I mean, who wants to go to Mass in a hotel, and barn? <clears throat> but did our Lord tell us it would be easy? Did he say, come follow me to the Hilton Hotel where we can uh, be in a jacuzzi all day? No. He said, come follow me. Renounce yourself, pick up your cross, and follow me. Where is he going? He goes to Calvary. Jesus goes to be crucified. That's where we are following him to. We have to follow him to the cross. That's the way it is. We love the cross. The cross is the key to heaven. It's shaped like a key to open the gates. The cross and all of us in our little sufferings on this earth share in the great cross of our Lord. And it's through this cross we go to heaven. Through this cross we go to the resurrection. Through the cross of following our Lord, professing the Catholic faith in a world that has turned its back on him. And look at the small details. You know, a mother having more than three children today is a, in America, it's a huge big deal. And the doctors try to convince her, you should have no more children. What kind of contraception do you want to use now and insult these good mothers? And you good mothers, if this happens to you, slap those doctors and tell them, you're not going to tell me not to have no more children. Children are a blessing from God. But that's part, that's just, that's not just Catholic teaching. This is just natural law. This is natural law. Even the animals don't even think about birth control. But our perverse age, our sick modern world, so twisted, has invented every single way to stop having children. 
And now with the late term abortions, it is now legalized for doctors to strangle a baby in the mother's womb right before birth, right before birth, and to pull it out dead. All this cries to heaven for vengeance. We're going to get it. We're going to get it. But in the meantime, we really are in the days as the world was, and it's worse than before the flood of Noah. Before the flood of Noah, Noah kept building the ark because it was God's will. God asked him to do it. His sons were probably wondering, Dad, are you sure you weren't drinking? Dad, here we are building a ship in the middle of the desert. There's no huge oceans nearby. There's no huge lakes nearby. And you're building this huge boat. Everybody thinks we're crazy. And you can bet they had NBC, ABC News with their helicopters filming this fanatic building a huge ship in the middle of nowhere. And Noah kept the faith. Noah did not compromise the Catholic faith. Did he suffer doubts? Probably the devil tried to attack him and say, well, maybe, you know, was it really God who ordered this? And, and uh, he had to pray for strength, I'm sure, himself. Because the whole world mocked the truth and despised God's laws. And perversion was normal. The, the rainbow parades filled the streets in those days. The laws were being passed to pass. Ireland has just fallen to the horrible sodomite laws which cry to heaven for vengeance. And the United States is, is falling fast. There's a few states that still oppose it. But without the Catholic faith, it's, it's hot air. And now you know the Muslims in England. There are now towns in England where the English people drive into their town. And the Muslims will throw rocks at them, tell them, get out of their city, they're taking over. So what are the Protestants in England? They're going to have a big, I think next week, a big march with, with uh, British flags. We're English, this is our country, we should have rights to our cities. And the Muslims are just mocking them and throwing rocks at them. And they're, the, the solution is not Protestant English, England. The solution for us is no longer the American Republic and George Washington and the Declaration of Independence. That's gone, folks. The only solution that is going to solve all the world's problems is our Lord Jesus Christ as God, as King, as priest, adored, and his name put on our Constitution, his laws of the Supreme Court, and his holy Catholic religion protected by the laws of the state. That's the only solution. But that even is, is a far cry because we have to convert. The souls have to love our Lord, love his commandments, want to go to heaven, want to escape hell. And who is that anymore? Where are the good-willed people anymore? Many say, Lord, Lord, but will not enter the kingdom of heaven, Christ said, because they don't want to follow our Lord, because our Lord's commandments demand that we, that we deny ourselves. And just go through all the commandments. Just go through all the commandments and see how the modern world treats each one of them, especially the sixth and the ninth commandment. Where is uh, the purity of marriage when the state promotes and, and, pro and promotes and funds divorce, makes it easy to divorce? When the law of God forbids divorce and uh, adultery and fornication and pornography, these things should be outlawed, censored by the state. It's poison and um, oppression of the poor. Most, <laughs> you don't even go to the, that, into that one. But uh, all the commandments are despised. Who's there left in the modern world that keeps, keeps the commandments? Who is there left that keeps the Catholic faith anymore? And our, Lord, our Lady told us it's, it's going to come down to a few, very few. But we also have a great promise of the Virgin Mary that she asked the Pope to consecrate Russia. None of these Popes have done it yet. 
and it looks like it's not going to be done. But we have the promise of the Virgin Mary. There will be a Pope that will finally consecrate Russia to my Immaculate Heart with all the bishops, the few bishops that are left maybe in the world still, because many nations by then will be completely blown off the face of the earth. And she said it will be done, but it will be late. And then Russia will convert to the Catholic faith and spread the kingship of Christ throughout the world. That's the picture. And Russia has been chosen by God to be the instrument to punish the world and also to convert the world again. So these are our times. So, dear faithful, you have to hold strong. And uh, the great weapon from heaven is the, blessed, the, the great rosary. Pray the rosary every day. And, and set that as a priority of your day. Maybe not the first thing you do in the morning, but make sure it's a priority sometime in your day, the daily rosary. And keep spiritual reading. Read. Read the works of Archbishop Lefebvre. Read the, uh, the there's a good website called The Recusant and the no, numerous good websites out there that, that are proclaiming the Catholic truth and also exposing the compromise of Bishop Fillet, which is very sad. It's very sad, but he has betrayed our Lord. He has betrayed the Catholic faith. And if I came out saying Vatican II is acceptable, 95% of it's acceptable, oh, but I didn't mean to say that. And I came out saying the new Mass is legitimately promulgated, oh, but I didn't really mean to say that. And I came out saying that the new Code of Canon Law is acceptable and the new profession of faith, oh, but don't believe me because I, I retract what I say. I, have, I, I am worth being pounded by tomatoes, eggs, being tarred and feathered and kicked out of, out of this place. Because if I speak like a modernist, which is that, I just gave the example, then you're a modernist. And you don't play with the Catholic faith. But, but we have now Bishop Follet and now numerous priests who are talking like him now. And it's, it's starting more and more. The collapse of the Society of St. Pius X is just another consequence of the Vatican II. And it's just another fulfilling of Our Lady of Fatima's prophecy that there will be a diabolical disorientation among the popes, the bishops, priests, and faithful. And even faithful today are messed up and confused. 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 So, what do we do? We have to turn to the Mother of God. She's our mother. And in the state of this hurricane, She's the only one that we can turn to to guide us in this darkness. And as one great Trappist monk said, uh, in, in the time of darkness, grab the hand of the Virgin Mary. Even though you can't see her, hold her hand and she will guide you to the light. And her hand is extended to us through her rosary and her scapula. Love these weapons. They are not just nice little ornaments for a Catholic ha house. They are real weapons. And then, uh, and then fight for the true Catholic faith. Proclaim the true Catholic faith. Which means we have to oppose the destruction of the Catholic faith. Which means you're going to be spit on, kicked out, called resistance, called dissidents, whatever they want to call you. Sede whatever they want to call you. We're not Sede we just want to stay faithful Catholics. And then defend and love the true Catholic Mass of the Roman Rite, the Tridentine Latin Mass. And uh, we know the Mass isn't everything because the Greek Orthodox and the Russian Orthodox and the Ukrainian Orthodox, they all have a valid Mass, but the wrong faith. And St. Peter's, they all have the nice Mass, the Tridentine Latin Mass. And in the days of the French Revolution, the juring priests, they all said the Tridentine Latin Mass. The juring priests of Mexico during the persecution, they all said the Latin Mass. The juring priests who, who promised they would never preach against communism in Hungary in the 1950s with Cardinal Mazzenti. Cardinal Mazzenti excommunicated all these priests who, who made peace with the communists. They were called the peace priests. And the Catholic people would not go to those Masses. Oh, but it was the Mass. It was valid. 
It was a Tridentine Mass. It wasn't the new Mass. But that's not the most important thing. You don't go to Masses where the priest does a public act and, and compromises the Catholic faith. You just don't. And that's why we do tell people we should not go to St. Peter's Mass, even though there are nice priests and they have nice smiles and many of them have good hearts. No one's condemning any persons here, but only positions. And then, uh, and now that's the way with the Society of Pius X. Until, and if you're upset about it, well, good, be upset. And call Bishop Fillet and tell him, do your duty, Your Excellency, and condemn your modernist statements. Condemn your modernist interviews. Condemn your modernist doctrinal declaration of April 15, 2012. Then we'll start going to your Mass and your priest's Mass. But until you make a clear stand, stop playing with the Catholic faith. And good luck, because you'll get, he can't, ex, he can't kick you out of the society. What can he do? He'll just ignore you or give you some wish-wash. This is how he's talking like a modern politician, sad to say. But our Lord didn't talk that way. Let your answer be yes, yes, or no, no, Christ said. The apostles, did they talk that way? Ambiguous? No. <laughs> That's why they were all martyred. St. Bartholomew was skinned alive. Did you know that? And St. Jude, that's why he's pictured always carrying a club. He was beaten to death with a club. And St. Andrew was crucified on a huge X-shaped cross, preaching on it the Catholic faith for three days. So they didn't talk nonsense in gibber and liberal wishwash. Nor did St. Pius X, that's why he was hated by the, the modern world. <clears throat> and Archbishop Lefebvre also. He didn't speak wish-wash. That's why the modernists hated him. But the good, shep the good sheep who hear the shepherd's voice of Christ, they knew that he was a good bishop. So, as Archbishop Lefebvre said, we must proclaim Christ as God and defend him. And all we're doing traditional Catholics is echoing the great cry of St. Michael the Archangel who was like unto God and all the angels and all the apostles and all the martyrs and confessors and virgins down the centuries and all the good popes. That's all we are proclaiming, the same truth that Christ is God. Christ is King. Christ is the only Savior, the only Redeemer. And He is the only eternal High Priest. And where next, next to his sacred heart stands always at the cross and at the Mass is the Immaculate Heart of Mary. Let her be your joy. Let her be your refuge. Let her be a mother to you and run to her like children to her. She, she's such a good mother and she's powerful. Powerful because even the name of Mary drives the devils away. And the devils themselves, they cannot say her name they cannot pronounce the name of Jesus and Mary. They cannot say it. It burns their mouth. And that's why they call her the Powerful One, or the Holy One, or the uh, other titles, but they cannot say her name. So love the name of Mary, and let it be on your lips often. And let us also pray that we die saying the name of Jesus and Mary. Do you know that in the Roman ritual, I'll close with this, in the Roman ritual, it says the priest is told when you're at the bedside of a dying person, whisper in this little prayer, Jesus, Mary, and Joseph, I give you my heart and my soul. Jesus, Mary, and Joseph, assist me in my last agony. Jesus, Mary, and Joseph, may I breathe forth my soul in peace with thee. Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. Lord Jesus, receive my soul. And that's what the priest will repeat in the ear of the dying. And so the last thing in their lips is the name of Jesus and Mary. So powerful. Because the devil attacks when someone's dying. He attacks that soul with everything he has. And so the soul, and all of us will face this, we have to arm ourselves with everything we have. And nothing more powerful than the name of Jesus and Mary. And you can throw in Joseph too, St. Joseph. So let's ask the Mother of God to uh, strengthen us in this last hour. And uh, as an as a ending appendix announcement, 
I remind you that May 13th began the Rosary Crusade, uh, called up by the Resistance Faithful, which goes to October 13th. And so be generous with the rosaries. And these intentions of the Rosary Crusade is none other than that the Pope do his duty and consecrate Russia to the Immaculate Heart of Mary. Because everything's going to keep falling apart and collapsing until the Pope finally obeys the Mother of God. It's on his shoulders, but it's also on ours because we have to pray and do penance that we get a Pope who will do his duty. O Mary conceived without sin, <clears throat> o Mary conceived without sin, O Mary conceived without sin, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost.